describes a computer program called AlphaGo, developed by Google DeepMind, which is um, a division of Google, um, which aims to develop uh, general artificial intelligence. And um, this um, um, Go playing program uh, reached kind of um, good results uh, even um, in the games against human. But uh, I don't want to give you spoilers for people who uh, don't read news or uh, don't read my handout in advance. And um, so, so this was uh, really big news. Uh, even my mom um, told me about it, that she read it in some Vietnamese newspaper without um, knowing it in advance that I would talk about it. And um, I have to know that my mom is not a scientist or an engineer, so it was uh, really like um, got the general audience. Okay, and just a brief outline of how the lecture will look like. So I will first um, motivate you uh, with some cool applications of AI, why you should like uh, take care and yeah, take care. And um, <coughs> then I will switch to some basics of machine learning to know what we are talking about different terms and methods, and uh, what else? Uh, the rules of Go, it's uh, kind of um, good to like at least uh, say them. And um, uh, so, and then I will describe uh, the internals of the AlphaGo program itself, and um, mention how it turned out in the results against other Go programs and um, um, matches against humans. Okay, so let's start with um, uh, why, why AI? And, uh, I think the best um, way to answer this question is to just show examples of some cool stuff that you can do with AI. So, um, you can have spam filters, obviously. So it's just like um, um, <coughs> deciding whether your whether email is like, appropriate uh, meant for you or is it so just something uh, unrequested. Um, recommender systems, for example, when you watch a TV series on Netflix or video on YouTube, uh, the system uh, kind of figure out, figures out what next, um, what will be the next appropriate video that you might be interested in. Um, predictive text, I just found this uh, recently on my smartphone, like it's really cool stuff that um, um, the phone uh, learns from your Facebook account and your Gmail and uh, your messages and it kind of uh, can create and predict like um, the, the word you are typing and often it's a very like um, it's like a tough decision if you want to like uh, finish the word or try to like uh, just type it out like uh, just to generate new words and to figure out if it uh, can figure out uh, the whole message but often it's really surprisingly successful. So it's on Samsung and Android and things like that. Uh, another application, audio recognition. So that means like, um, for example, when you walk in a supermarket or you're in a coffee shop and you hear a very lovely song, so there's no real way how to ha uh, like find out what the song is. You cannot really go to the store manager and ask about what's playing right now. So this application on a smartphone, you can take it out. Uh, take a sample of the sound and uh, it will try to recognize what the song it is. So, for example, we have Shazam for sound home. Next, uh, there's some um, music generation, which is like um, artificial intelligence that um, tries to create a new song um, 
So basically, you can check out the deep here, which is composing harmonizing music with neural networks. It was some <coughs> uh, project of some student from MIT. And yeah, so something to listen to. And of course, I have to mention self driving cars when we are talking about AI. So, for example, Google Car is doing a lot of um, advancement in this field. And um, yeah, it's a very famous application. And um, so there are some more applications which I, I would like to mention in detail. So, for example, um, how to reply feature of Google Inbox. So, basically, you get an email and um, neural network, which I will describe later, uh, tries to figure out the three most um, uh, useful responses uh, based on the text of the email. And uh, it's very um, successful, even the even though uh, when, when the email itself is kind of complicated, like here when they talk about some server issues and uh, things like that. So uh, the neural network uh, figures out uh, uh, different responses and also tries to make it uh, varied so not to repeat itself. So um, that's often very useful in those applications. Um, another cool application is a recent uh, breakthrough in um, image generation. So we got this hacker and um, uh, that guy um, um, recently um, created this um, neural network which takes uh, <coughs> uh, two images as input and recreates uh, one image in the style of a uh, the other picture. So we can add the. So these guys are from the University of Tübingen, so I guess this must be uh, Tübingen. And uh, this is like a um, uh, picture or image by Franco. So this would be, the result would be uh, uh, the picture of Tübingen in Franco style. And um, there are the, the other guys who uh, claim their that they are better than the previous guys, so you can see it's quite recent, 2016. And so they have like first input, a girl uh, drawn in pencil, and a picture of a girl. And so this would be the result if you take um, this content, but uh, draw it in the, the style of a, of a picture. And this would be the uh, what it from. So, um, <coughs> Behind this, there are some neural networks uh, which are able to extract somehow <coughs> the features of uh, the style. And uh, that's very um, um, uh, novel, surprising, because even the humans are not sure what, uh, what, uh, what makes a, a certain style, like um, the, typical, the typical style of the, of the artist. So, the neural network figured it out like even before humans. <coughs> so another application um, is um, generating um, generating text, generating stuff. So uh, this guy he um, made um, AI system which can, uh, based on um, eight thousand baby names, started to create a new um, idea or names of babies. So for example, well, the name baby is not really um, um, yeah, original, but uh, they are like um, kind of uh, good ideas which can be like, interesting. So it's just like a domain. Okay. So in a similar um, way, we can also generate um, C code. So the guy, um, he took um, the repository of uh, Linux source code, and not just the kernel because that wasn't enough, <coughs> it was like all GitHub kernels, <coughs> and trained a recurrent neural network on it, which is a special type of neural network. And it learned, um, okay, uh, the code doesn't uh, always make sense because sometimes you have like um, variables that were not defined, but that's about the same. Office. What's interesting is that um, it can, figure out uh, the basic uh, structure of a programming language. So for example, it uh, can know that after if, there needs to be a condition in parentheses. 
and the block in current records. Uh, so um, just uh, how it works, it's, um, it starts with a uh, few letters and then it uh, tries to predict uh, what uh, letters should um, fall afterwards. And then <coughs> it records the way it falls and falls and in the end it creates the whole um, text, which in this case is the source code. <coughs> Interestingly enough, uh, there was another example by, by this guy and uh, in that example, um, in this comment part, the neural network cannot figure out how to put the GNU license. So it um, put like, the exact, uh, but perfect copy of GNU license um, before the source code itself. So this is C. And uh, since we are a mathematician, I, we should also like, think about um, LaTeX. So um, the, the same <coughs> neural network um, generated a LaTeX source code. And it was almost perfectly compilable, just like minor tweaks in the end. So this is like an example of an um, article uh, created by the AI about um, algebra, algebraic geometry. And you can see it even tried to like uh, do some diagrams. Like not perfectly, but still like it's pretty impressive like, to see things like proof omitted. So there must be something in, in the training set about like, omitted proofs. And um, it's really impressive that um, maybe we as mathematicians might be a little bit concerned about the general practices. Okay. There are solutions to mass exams. <laughs> so does, the, this is a text that's generated by artificial intelligence? Yeah, it generated the LaTeX uh, source code. Yeah. Surprisingly, it was almost perfectly compiled. And, uh, well, <coughs> talk has written some lemma and after that some proof. Does that proof uh, anyhow correspond to the lemma? Is it just uh, yes, a that's random a, set yeah. of uh, verbs that we would expect in an article of this topic? So it's the letter case. It's similar with the C code. Like you can see on the semantic level it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But the syntactic it learned the, the structure and the pattern. So I, I okay I say it in advance like so behind this there's a neural network which has a special unit called uh, long short term memory so it can like <coughs> have a short term memory and it can remember few as characters so with this and of course it won't remember it but it can figure it out and then after if you will have some structure like, like this so with this <coughs> you can learn and then you can use it for generation it doesn't remember okay. the text itself but to see that it can like kind of nicely structured text, like even freshmen would write it like this. So it's just some um, stunning part. And with LaTeX, it was um, basically a similar thing. But the diagrams are really like, yeah. <coughs> OK. So that's on the next slide. Um, so this is also uh, kind of from the realm of uh, um text generation. So there's a um, Twitter, Twitter account called Deep Drum and it stands for um, deep, like from deep learning and drum. D is for Donald and Trump is the suffix of Trump. So it's a Twitter bot that has learned the language of Donald Trump from these speeches. So it's like artificial intelligence <coughs> that tries to create um, tweets that sounds like Donald Trump. <laughs> and because Donald Trump has some kind of very unnatural language, um, often these uh, unnatural sounding language uh, tweets are very like um, reliable and they seem like uh, they were spoken by Donald Trump. So my favorite one is um, I am what Isis doesn't need. This, this sounds um, very, very much like Donald Trump. So it's, Really cool, and you can even follow uh, this um, this guy. So, so it was yeah yeah it was uh, created by uh, Brady Hayes from MIT very recently, 2016. And uh, yeah, just uh, the application. <coughs> very so does it have, does it have many followers? Um, you can see some. You have like so many. Sorry. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, um, yeah. Um, it's not. 
20,000 followers right here. And some tweets, uh, we have like 200 retweets. Like, I think we did IG screen, it was 200 retweets. And it's really nice. Like, it even tries the hashtags and things like that. And, and that's when we become reels. And for some reason, it does sound really good. Right. It was really interesting because um, speak, um, to, to make a good neural network, you need a lot of data to train on. But um, other speeches of Donald Trump for discussions, uh, discussions uh, on TVs and things like that, uh, they are not enough to make a good neural network. But in this case, it's actually a good thing because it creates this very unnatural sounding language. When you, because uh, Donald Trump just sounds like it's not very natural. So uh, does it produce like uh, one tweet a day or, or does it react to, to the current events? Um, then it just creates the tweet. So the way it, it, it's not automatic. Um, just uh, the guy creates the tweet. He goes through them, and when he finds something interesting, he posts. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, with all the text. Interesting. Okay. Oh, by the way, this guy, Emis Vasilev, <coughs> is the uh, founder of uh, Google DeepMind, CEO, and um, we will talk about. Him. <coughs> so another publication is um, uh, a Terry player, also developed by Google Mind. So it's an artificial um, program which uh, plays uh, all Atari games. And the cool thing about it is um, that it's one algorithm of trying to play any Atari game that it can get. And um, since the mission of uh, DeepMind is to create um, general artificial intelligence and not like specific machine learning with specific <coughs> inputs, um, they need to be sure that uh, it learns everything on itself. So that means like um, uh, the input it gets is like um, <coughs> this, uh, stream of images to the artificial intelligence and uh, the AI and um, it's connected to controllers of, uh, in the game. And um, so for initially it doesn't even know it's a image stream or it just sees, sees the bits and bytes. And after some time it needs to like uh, learn how to play the game. And so, for example, uh, this game is called Wake Up. So yeah, you move with the back here and you have a ball here and it uh, moves like by, by the laws of physics like a pinball, and you hit uh, the wall, the colorful wall here, so every time you hit something, it just disappears, and uh, the goal of the game is to get rid of all of this without like, the wall falling out, so it's a classic third <coughs> game, and um, so um, the, the surprising, um, the surprising um, feature of, of this is that um, it uh, got to the superhuman level. By superhuman, I mean like it got better than humans, than any human can be. So initially, um, it's better to, to see it on video, but initially the, the Atari player didn't know like what's going on, and just randomly tried to move. But after some training, it's a better, like a professional human. And the cool thing is that um, at one point, they let it train for a really long time, and he figured a strategy uh, which no human knew in before. And the strategy is like to tunnel out through, through the wall and keep the ball like, hitting here and going in here, which uh, uh, scores you the most points. And it's like a kind of like a trick that, um, no, that, was, that was known before. So, yeah, it's uh, really, really surprising that artificial intelligence figure out something that even the programmers and designers didn't know figure out something new. Okay. So, um, this is a, a strip comic from XKCD, which is a web uh, comic about um, life, everything, and um, stuff which are related to science and um, mathematics and geometry. <coughs> and uh, it's often very humorous. And in, in this um, plot, it, uh, it shows uh, various games from the easiest one to the hardest one. 
and um, it uh, categorized it by how soft, how much soft they were. So, for example, tic tac toe and uh, name and these games they were perfectly soft. Mathematically, one of them. And in this category of uh, computers that um, you can uh, that are basically at the superhuman level. Uh, so surprisingly, you can have computers uh, that are just Counter Strike or Vietnam. <laughs> And, um, and how, how can be the computer drunk? Uh, <laughs> That's why it's there. I must admit, I'm the. Maybe if you put it as an extra feature. Yes, you have an error. So, uh, most famous is chess. They were um, sold in the 90s by when you did go. Uh, Win uh, the tournament against uh, world champion Gary Kasparov, and also Geopardy, which is kind of like a quiz show. Uh, that was uh, won by IBM Watson, supercomputer. So also secret and um, Starcraft. Um, yeah. So so of course uh, this is the humorous part, but they are these games that uh, computers may never outplay humans because they are just like just fun games. Uh, for example, Kelvin Boy is basically like a baseball but you just create rules by yourself. You can score <coughs> any way you want, and do anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> the only rule is that you can never apply the same rule twice. But it's <laughs> and uh, also, uh, Seven Minutes in Heaven is a teasing game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I show this. Uh, I wanted to show this strip because um, last year, or quite recently, there was a uh, one kind of interesting shift. That's that's poker, which is what I'm so doing with in my studies. So poker, I like, move up, and um, in in a way that um, special variant of poker. It's up when the poker uh, was sold. So, uh, heads up means uh, two players, and limit is um, you, you are limited in uh, what uh, bets you can do in the game. So, it's uh, much simpler than when you can uh, bet any, um, any, any integer number. System. But, so, this, um, these guys from uh, Bowen et al., from University of Alberta, Created uh, poker bot, Citarus, uh, which um, uh, computed a almost perfect Nash equilibrium to poker. So it's so perfect that it would take a lifetime for a few months to like, get significantly uh, like, um, to win some money. So it's a very <coughs> robust playing. It's really hard to gain something against it. And it uses um, also similar ideas from AlphaGo, uh, that's uh, namely Monte Carlo research, but I will talk about it later. Okay. So uh, let's talk about some basics of machine learning. You know, uh, um, to be able to use the terms. So uh, two big areas in machine learning are uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. So just what's the difference between them? So when you have supervised learning, um, you need some data to train the artificial intelligence. So uh, in supervised learning, the data must be a labor. What does it mean? It means that um, to the sample of, uh, of a, from the data set, you give it the ground truth, or grand truth, like what it actually is. Like, uh, it needs to be done by human. So for example, you have a database of emails, and there you have labels, is it a regular email, or is it a spam? Or when you have images, you can uh, tag them into category and say, is it a duck or is it a face? So um, on the other hand, um, unsupervised learning. Uh, so not surprisingly, like, the data set is not labeled. And uh, it seems counterintuitive, like, what can AI uh, 
create from it, but um, it, it can try to cluster the data into different groups, uh, which uh, group the similar things. So for example, uh, you can group similar news together, so there was this Google News things, which uh, group uh, um, news on a similar topic um, into one, into um, groups that uh, are relying to So we uh, will need a supervised learning now for alpha group. And uh, this is a uh, basic overview of how um, supervised learning works at uh, the different stages. So, uh, first of all, you need to collect the data. So, for example, every time you search something on Google, that's data collection for Google. Every time you like something on Facebook, that's some money for Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and when you talk to Siri, which, uh, movies on Netflix, and you watch YouTube, that also counts as data collection. Uh, LHC collisions, and uh, that's some um, big physics thing that <coughs> uh, collides uh, photons together, and they also generate a lot of data, actually. And, yeah. and um, so for AlphaGo, the, the data set was a um, KGS server, uh, KGS Go server, uh, which is uh, I guess a public server where you can play Go humans so uh, and it's public available. So it's a good thing. So the next step in the surprise uh, learning, so the, the data this one here. The next step uh, is uh, training. And um, for good reasons, you need to take the data set and split it into a part which is uh, dedicated for training and the part which is dedicated for uh, testing. So when, when you um, apply a learning <coughs> algorithm um, to the uh, training data, it creates some model, uh, which uh, if, uh, if a new um, piece of data is given, and the model tries to predict like, uh, what should happen with this. So first, it is, it's just like this part of training. Something sets up some parameters, that's model. And uh, then you use that model to make uh, predictions on something that was never seen before. Is it? Yeah, good. Okay. So, and when this model is uh, trained, then it goes, it goes uh, alive. Okay. Uh, so, um, regression. Um, so far, there were, um, in this spring school of computerics, there were many um, lectures which um, mentioned regression a lot, so it must be a very well-known topic for you. So there were different approaches, like interval regression, larger statistical regression, this kind of uh, other regressions. So, and, uh, so I would also like to um, share my favorite uh, form <coughs> of regression which is a movie <coughs> regression with my favorite uh, British actress, Emma Watson. So this was uh, released at the end of last year, and it's very interesting and uh, sweet. But what we need for um, <laughs> AlphaGo is a different kind of regression, and it's a mathematical regression. So um, basically the task is um, you have data, which is here, for example, the x, y, uh, points, right? and you try to figure out this line. So, um, in, in a perfect case, the data would be perfect for any nodes, and you can make one straight line. But here, you, mm -hmm. they are not collinear. So, we, we try to make um, a so-called fit that uh, tries to be as uh, precise as possible. And this precision is uh, captured here in um, this so-called uh, means means per error, so which is like uh, for for the fitting line, you count what the error was, like how far from the line it, it was, and um, accumulate the squares of it. 
So that's the regression. Is it a, um, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, kind of the um, other approach is a uh, classification. So you have data, uh, which are, let's say, cats and dogs. So those are red and those are green. And you try to uh, make a model which classifies them uh, correctly. So one way would be to create a line here, which uh, separates uh, dogs here and cats here, but it's not perfect. It's that some cats that are recognized from dogs, and the way around dogs recognize as cats. And uh, so you can also make it a different way, very complicated, like this. And uh, so that uh, comes to the next uh, idea, which is uh, underfitting and overfitting. It's a, like a problem uh, in machine learning, which can uh, occur or happen when you are not um, careful. So, uh, in, in the first line, there's a regression task, and the second line, there's a classification task. And uh, what does it mean to underfit? So, to underfit means that your model is uh, too simple. Like, for example, when you have points that are following the, the curve and you try to fit them with a straight line that's just like um, cannot capture the pattern or like here the classification with the line was not a, a smart idea to use with one. Uh, underfitting is bad, but uh, what's also uh, very very bad is the uh, the other um, end of the spectrum when the model is way too complicated and um, so that happens for example here, and the data, and you fit it with a polynomial with a too high degree, or uh, here when you classify the data, and you see it's not very natural to like, uh, go around like this. So this happens when um, the model learns the training data by heart, and uh, instead of uh, trying to figure out a general <coughs> principles, it just learns the data in uh, heart. So uh, be careful of it. It's, um, my, the analogy would be, it's like learning for a math exam by memorizing proofs. Like, uh, sometimes it can work, for example, with Professor Lobo, it's a very high chance to pass the exam like this, but usually it's you, what you want to do is uh, not memorize the proof, but get out the, the general idea to be able to apply it to uh, uh, some slight other variations. So, shortly about reinforcement learning. Um, and so, uh, we have an agent, it's a, this guy here, and uh, the system, and uh, the environment. And he can uh, get an uh, like input from the environment through some observations. And what he can do is uh, to do some actions to the environment and uh, get another observation. And, uh, so it goes around and the guy tries to um, achieve some goal which was uh, given to it. So it's like basically living, living the life. Okay. And a uh, special, um, or for us, important type of reinforcement learning is uh, games of survival when uh, agent um, is interacting with himself, kind of. So he's like playing the game from both positions and um, trying to improve himself. So we will see this concept a lot. And for you to know what does it mean in software. So we go to the Monte Carlo research uh, topic. Um, so uh, research is um, when we want to solve games that can be represented as trees. And, um, <coughs> Uh, so there's an optimal value we start for, for, for any state in, in the tree and which can determine the outcome of the game. So it's from every board position uh, or the status and um, presumes that uh, all the players are playing perfectly. <coughs> so this is the, uh, the value of who would win in the ideal perfect world. So this is like if we know this for every state, every uh, node in the game tree, then we basically know how to play perfect. 
um, it can be computed by recursively traversing a search tree. And uh, this search tree contains um, uh, approximately b to the d possible uh, sequences how to play, where uh, b is the breadth of the game, so it is, uh, corresponds to number of moves possible per position, and d is the depth. So it's a very approximate uh, number of the future. So um, in the case of uh, chess, uh, the breath is uh, <coughs> the breath and depth are like this. And go is um, you see it's much larger, and uh, this means that there are more positions in go than there are atoms in the universe. So it's really hard to do exhaustive search because you don't have even enough atoms to do anything. And so that's uh, what uh, was mentioned in DeepMind, that uh, it makes Go a Google times more complex than chess. So I think it's worth it because they are uh, in the Google now. So how to handle the size of the game tree? So basically, um, by using some smart heuristics, how to reduce uh, these two variables, B and D. So for the breadth of the of, uh, Game tree, uh, we will create a neural network which smartly selects moves. For the depth of the tree, we will create a neural network which um, evaluates the position so we don't need to go deep down. And uh, for the traversing the tree, instead of uh, doing exhaustive traverse, we employ the Monte Carlo tree search, which, is, uh, which I will. Right now, so Monte Carlo tree search um, is um, like a Monte Carlo version of a tree search. So instead of uh, going every time through all the tree, you just uh, select some move based on some probability distribution, and uh, you go down all the way, you simulate, and uh, then. You get to the end of the game, get the value if you won or lose, and propagate this value back up to, to the root. And uh, then you, you repeat this step and um, try to, um, inst so instead of going all the ways, you try to uh, uh, go only one way, but with a proper way of, of uh, choosing this way. So let's talk, um, let's give an intro to neural networks. So what is a neural network? So it was uh, inspired by the neural, neural structure of the mammalian cerebral cortex. That means uh, the outer part of the brain, which is really developed in a high primate humans. And um, but on my small scale, so there are not hundreds of billions of neurons, but usually hundreds of thousands. And it's like um, you can um, imagine it as here on the picture. So you have some, uh, so these are the neurons, circles, and there are connections between them. And usually you have like a layer of the neurons which are, uh, are input. Uh, put the input inside and uh, a layer for the output which goes up. And in between there are some hidden layers do some doing some Uh, uh, the neural networks are suitable to model systems with a high tolerance of error. So that, that's the audio recognition, uh, image classifications. It's not really good to use it for your bank account because of this. It's not a good idea. And yeah, that's what I just said. Audio recognition. So there are uh, two modes of uh, neural network. The first one is the feed forward. So basically that's uh, when you uh, make the prediction, make the computation. So here goes the input. And there are some weights on these uh, connections, on these edges. And uh, in the next area, uh, they get summed up. And uh, then the, uh, the sum is applied to this uh, function, which is called the activation function. <coughs> 
and uh, the activation function has a special. It's, it's important for them. And uh, so, just to mention the uh, second mode, it's the back propagation mode for learning. So, that would be going back because, uh, so with the feed forward, you get the input, and in the end, you get one uh, number. And uh, you, <coughs> you train this uh, with a supervised learning. So, that means like uh, the input is the data, and you get uh, some prediction from the neural network, uh, but you also get the label from the data set. And you can see like how correct it was. So this um, measure of correctness needs to get propagated back uh, of the way to the input layer, and um, the error will then change and <coughs> kind of wiggle up with the weights on the connections. So all, all the work is happening in, in the weights. And uh, so this is that's called back propagation. Uh, for and uh, often. Um, Neural networks, like um, this, is just just a model. But usually, in a computer, you just store the uh, the weights, and basically, it's just like uh, vector multiplication. So uh, you don't really want to create a C plus plus object or a neural. Yes. Um, so uh, then, example of a feed forward. So input is one. Uh, for this other neural, it's one. You get. Uh, 0.8, 0.2, that sounds like 1, and um, the other example is 0.4, and 0.9, it sounds like 1.3. And then activation in, uh, function is applied, and that uh, triggers a 0 0.3, or half of the number. And in the end, it goes to the output. So this is uh, what happens actually in the brain with neurons. Like they only activate when they have a high enough uh, sum here, so that uh, and then the Activation function is large enough to activate and go to next level. So that was the motivation. And uh, so I want to mention gradient descent in neural networks. So um, the motto is, um, as I said, with the propagation, uh, the neural network is trained by mistakes. So um, based on the mistakes, you um, make it better and more precise. And What's behind the, the so the neural network is basically just one function which gets the input and output uh, uh, number and uh, uh, the mistake is captured by the the, the means by error yeah. and um, so this would be uh, if we had a neural network with uh, weights uh, two, two two weights and we plot it. Uh, the error right here. So the gradient descent is uh, means uh, that if you are um, you have some vectors and you want to make steps and get to the global minimum, which is the place where you uh, make the least error. And so gradient descent would uh, is um, uh, computes the gradient and uh, goes in, in the way of the negative way. So it tries to <coughs> step, 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 and go iteratively to the minimum. So of course, uh, this uh, is often problematic because uh, the error functions are not necessarily convex or uh, so as the smooth, so it can uh, be stuck in a local minimum. Uh, there are various ways to get rid of this. And so now let's switch to the deep neural network and uh, say what's the inspiration behind it. So um, in, in a brain, when we think and we recognize that we have hierarchies of uh, concepts. And um, so for example, when you're driving on, on the street and you see objects, cars, things like this, so first and you just see like the, the straight lines and then uh, they are uh, composed into higher hierarchies going up, 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 up to the uh, level of the hierarchy when you can see uh, this uh, this is an Eiffel Tower. Uh, no. Then then so the, so the deep neural network tries to uh, imitate this by having a large number of layers to capture the same uh, here. And uh, 
so uh, especially convolutional neural network are um, 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 used in AlphaGo, and um, so uh, the convolution neural network is very suitable for images. Um, uh, you, you get the, in, the input is an image, and you go many many layers to output uh, some classification. So you can see that uh, the first layer would be just simple curves, and the second layer would be like the, uh, eyes, or noses, and uh, in, the, in the last hidden layer, you can see the whole faces of the And uh, just to mention convolutional, uh, is, um, they have a special trick how to deal with uh, uh, images. That, uh, that means uh, that uh, when, when you say convo convolution or filter, it's, it's like a frame or window going. Uh, uh, around the image and taking the parts of the image, and because um, the, the problem with, uh, for example, face recognition is like uh, that you, if you have a face and it's just shifted a bit uh, to this, this side, you want to recognize the face again. So you, you would like to be uh, invariant to a natural transformation, like shift or just changing in the light. So uh, the, the this is the rule of the convolution, which uh, tries to uh, do with this. It's a, yeah, it's a bit um, uh, technical to describe it precisely, but they the, are the suitable for this. And in, in God, it will be also. So, just to uh, mention briefly some uh, the rules of the goal. And, uh, <coughs> so, the interruption is that. Um, there are classic games. Uh, so, for example, uh, Bekemon uh, is um, often compared as a man versus fate because you use the dice there to deal with the chance and you can often lose just because of bad luck. And chess is uh, as good man versus man because you're marching with pawns and trying to capture the king. And uh, so the goal is. Uh, compared to man versus uh, himself, because uh, often when a uh, go player knows uh, his exact rank, uh, then he would uh, lose half of the game, so there needs to be a lot of patience. So I just want to say that this picture was uh, taken yesterday when there was a hot match happening right here between, uh, between uh, the two uh, go players in our group. So, <coughs> so, just uh, really so, so, And so, there are two players, but uh, they are playing against each other, but it starts the game. And uh, it's very simple, there are two basic rules. The rule of liberty uh, is um, Thing. So it's like an analogy of the uh, army, like when uh, soldiers are completely surrounded by the enemy, they are captured. And uh, another rule is the core rule, uh, which is to um, eliminate uh, the possibility of unending cycles. So uh, the core rule states that you sh should not play in such a way that you would get to a position that was already previously <coughs> So we are here and uh, you put a black stone here and you remove the white stone and now the white can put the stone here and will like switch back to the position here of the game that never ends. And also there are possibility for uh, so-called handicap when two players are really different in uh, strength or white. So, White can have a right to place uh, some stones in advance before uh, as a compensation for uh, the greatest strength of the work. And uh, to mention the scoring groups, um, to win the game. So, player uh, scores is the number of stones that are on the board. 
across the number of, of empty intersections surrounded by the fire stones. And there's also uh, combination points for the white point, because, um, which is a compensation for the first move advantage. So this is decided in advance before the customers. And, uh, and obviously, the guy with more letter score wins. So, uh, some ranks of the players. Um, so, you can have a style system which is the cues and dance, or it resembles um, karate or aikido, stuff like that. Or, for example, in taekwondo, you can have a slow dance, but the cues are all different. And so, for, for beginners, you assign cues, and um, then for more advanced players you have dance and the highest uh, lead is uh, professional dance. Also you can um, alternatively use table ratings, which is a uh, assigned number to the player. <coughs> and the player means uh, the difference in their levels uh, should be proportional, should describe like the uh, chance to win or the chance of a stronger player. So it's a uh, like in chess, there's a game out of this. So, uh, I would like to make a small uh, break, chocolate break. Uh, I was, um, so I need some time to sit on, and uh, I like it ahead, and I would like to thank you for welcoming me here. And so I brought you some. Uh, Perfect, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Better be here than now, sir. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's enough of it, but, so I think it, we should apply the rule uh, ladies first, so we can, or, okay, so we can, like, ladies first. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, should I pass it around? So I wanted to bring a little bit of um, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So if you want me, I just Uh, 
This is basically the convolution. It captures a small part of the, of the input, but uh, it, uh, it scans through the whole board, and then it gets uh, summarized in one neuron. And uh, from this layer, uh, it goes uh, to uh, this ha summarizing happens like uh, through all the layers. And um, uh, also, um, yeah, also there are some technicalities about the convolution that makes it uh, really nice to uh, deal with the shifts and the translations and transformations in the task. So, this is the basic overview of how uh, the neural networks are trained in, in AlphaGo. <coughs> so, we start, uh, we have some uh, data set input, which are the human expert positions taken from the KGS. Uh, server. And uh, for the task of classification, we create uh, two deep convolution neural networks, the raw policy and the uh, SL supervised learning policy network. Uh, so the raw policy, the raw is, um, is the um, simpler version of the SL policy network. Uh, there will be a reason for it, but it's basically just faster but less accurate. And there is a RL policy network, reinforcement policy network, and uh, uh, this, this network is trained through the self-play uh, uh, self training. And uh, uh, so this generates the new data set, the games that we are created through the self-play stage. And uh, using that data set, uh, we apply the regression and um, to train the value network. So I will talk about each of these network uh, more in detail now. <coughs> so the SL policy network uh, is one. So it's a 13 layer deep convolution neural network. And its goal is to predict uh, uh, the expert human. So it gets a board position, it tries to predict like uh, what human actually played in the next move. So that's the goal. And, uh, so this is the task of classification because you uh, take the input and you classify it into every possible move on, on the game and um, you say uh, how, how much probability is it played here or here. And so, as I mentioned, it was trained from 30 million positions from the KGS, the server. And uh, it uses, uh, for optimization, it uses the stochastic gradient ascent so uh, that means going in, in the direction of the gradient. So uh, this term, uh, delta, delta sigma, is uh, the update uh, after every iteration of the neural network. And it's proportional to this uh, uh, right-hand side. And um, so for some technical reasons, uh, we, we use logarithms because uh, that's a machinery of neural networks. But so the reason, uh, the goal is to maximize uh, the likelihood of the human move A uh, selected in state S. So it tries to uh, get right like what humans would do. So from in the data set, you you know what the next move was. So uh, what are some results of this voice network? So. Um, the other people, the other guys, they got 44.4% accuracy, and they were the, the best programs uh, available at that uh, time. And this network itself, when uh, when you give it just the, the board uh, as a 19 by 19 image, uh, reaches 55.7% accuracy. And you, if you give it even more input, so there are there's possibility to give it additional information like um, Atari and uh, other stuff but it's basically the, the same thing as here but uh, um, more information as input so that gets to the 57% risk so it's already just this one network is uh, much better than anything before the accuracy of what? of predicting the <coughs> next move as human so you get a board position and then you try to guess what humans played in the next move. And 57% um, it 
guess who? He's like the uh, fifty-seven percent of uh, women who play golf uh, plays as as same as as the business club. Well, it's well, probably to distribution. Uh, so you get the network, you train it, and you have some weights fixed. And now it's like a uh, ready product. And now you test its accuracy on a new data <laughs> that you've never seen. So you give it a positions that it was it never saw. It was uh, that they are not the training set. And on that you decide. Uh, you, you take. Um, you pass it through the network, and the network says what the next move uh, it thinks it, it is, and you compare it with uh, what actually happened in the human Okay, okay. So, so that's uh, the exact move? Yeah, so <coughs> it's, uh, that's why I'm um, highlighting it. Uh, the goal of it is to predict the human expert moves. It's important because later there will be a other goal. Which is it good? Yes. I, I didn't do this because there are some 300. Uh, uh, intersections on the board, and it seems that I mean, in, the feeling of even of, uh, better players than I am is that frequently many positive, many moves are equally good or so. It is hard to distinguish between them. So if, uh, and this means that there's better than fifty percent, so I mean, better than uh, one move out of two. So. If you if you uh, were for, if you uh, so succeeded in to reducing this three hundred uh, points to just two and say uh, one of these two are for the best uh, next moves, then this would be if perhaps uh, fifty percent. This is better. So this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I think not yeah. uh, everything, but uh, I'm just saying it's uh, um, I think there's a difference between <coughs> deciding what is the best move and deciding what humans were. True. The task of this is to predict humans, not to predict the best move. Yes? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a slight difference, but very important. <coughs> so, can I go on? Yes. Um, just to get um, the idea. So, small improvements in the accuracy uh, led to large improvements <coughs> in playing strength. And so, here on the axis, you have like how precise this uh, neural network was, and um, on the y-axis, um, you basically let it play, uh, go, and uh, get the winning rate. So we see that, uh, yeah, th that's what we would expect, uh, more precise, uh, the better chances to win. And uh, this is an example how uh, the neural network was um, I, would, I like to think about it as a, a dreaming. So these are the move probabilities taken directly from the SL neural network. And um, the numbers are shown only for um, percentages which are above 0.1%. So we see that things like for 60%, the, best, uh, uh, the, the move that humans would play would be here. And uh, okay, uh, this example I will uh, we will use it also later. This is uh, from informal match between AlphaGo and the European champion Juan Hui. Pronounce <coughs> it correctly. And um, so <coughs> this network would guess that human play here. Okay, so that was uh, this neural network, and now we will talk about the role of this. So Raw Poise is uh, P pi P P pi uh, is uh, faster than the SL Poise network, but it's less accurate. And um, so the accuracy of only 24.2%, um, uh, but it takes uh, two microseconds to select an action for this neural network when compared to three milliseconds in the case of the previous one. So there will be um, reason to use it because um, in one way we need to do uh, fast simulations rather than accuracy. And it's um, basically just a simple version of the SLP. So uh, I think in the next slide I will talk about the reinforcement learning poison network um, which uh, are trained through the self -play. Okay, so reinforcement poison networks. So in, in the architecture, they are exactly the same, identical to the 
the network which uh, try to uh, predict the human moves. So that means that neurons there were also 13 layers and they were connected um, in the same way. Um, so this is the difference. The goal of this network is not to predict what human would win, but uh, the goal is actually to win the game against itself. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a slight difference, but uh, this is actually the genius move of um, um, of DeepMind because uh, uh, okay, this is a task of classification again because we select a move, we categorize it, and so the the, the genius idea of uh, uh, this network is to initialize uh, its weights. That means the weights on the connections uh, to to the weights of the the neural network which predict, was predicting the human moves. So. That means like we always start with a very good uh, parameters, very good weight, uh, yeah, high quality, and from from that we only improve. And now our goal is to actually win in the game. So again, uh, it's trained for the games of software and. Uh, So um, it's playing. Um, so we take a our own policy network, this neural network, and let it play some game uh, against uh, some previous iteration of the neural network. And um, it's important that uh, it doesn't play against it uh, the against the last iteration because. If you do that, then that would uh, oh, again the overfitting would happen. That's why I was mentioning it because it would just get used to its previous version and it would uh, just memorize and get used to just one version. But if we let it play against some uh, random, like the, the zero generation and uh, other stuff, it would be more uh, able to generalize uh, better uh, rather than overfitting. So that's why. Uh, overfitting uh, was mentioned before. So again, the way to optimize uh, uh, this neural network is again uh, st stochastic gradient ascent. So the weights are updated in a way that they are proportional to this um, um, right hand side in the partial der derivative. And so uh, where it's at times the t, the reward function, this one, uh, is plus one or minus one, uh, depending on winning and losing. So that was uh, the only difference uh, against uh, the previous SL policy. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So. What, what's happening here is uh, we take this uh, reinforcement learning network and let it play against um, other um, artificial agents. So when we let it play against the SL supervised learning policy network, which was the one which was just trying to predict the next human move, it could win in 80% of cases. So it was important to give it a goal to win the game, not to predict what humans would play. Uh, would win in 85% uh, of times against the strongest open source Go program, Pashit, which is uh, which is developed by Baudish and Gailey. And the interesting stuff uh, is uh, Peter Baudish is um, uh, related to art faculty, and he was actually once my teacher, so he's a really smart guy. And he, uh, in his program, he's using Monte Carlo research and uh, really cool stuff. But still, 85% of time. Just uh, for comparison, uh, the previous uh, best programs, uh, when they were uh, trying to do the same stuff with supervised learning of convolution neural networks, uh, they could reach only 11% of their quotes win rate. So it's not really win rate, but it's uh, only in 11% of cases they were able to actually defeat Pachi, which was not easy. 
Okay, so I talk about uh, this network, this network, this network. So let's now move to the value network. So um, yesterday when I had this um, great opportunity to keep it uh, the great game here, uh, there was one question which was very common. And, um, few people ask it independently of each other, and uh, it seems like it's a very important question. So the question is like, who's leading now? Or what's the score? It's very complicated. And, uh, from what I heard, uh, it's not very really easy to answer that question. But it is the task for this neural network. The value of the neural network to try to predict who will win the game. So, the value network is similar in the architecture to the policy network, but outputs a single prediction instead of the probability distribution over the whole board, so just one percentage. And its goal to estimate is to estimate the value function. So the value function predicts the outcome when given the position and when point according to the policy uh, key strategy. So it's an uh, expected outcome when you select the moves based on the given probability distribution of moves. So um, specifically, this value network, V theta S, tries to approximate, approximate this uh, mathematical value function. And uh, so this is uh, what would be the expected outcome when we use uh, the reinforcement learning policy network for um, doing uh, the sampling. And uh, this reinforcement, uh, this value here is uh, again the approximation to the ideal perfect, uh, the best uh, value of the gate, the, the one that I mentioned before with the big field. You can solve it because of that. So, uh, with transitive we see uh, that this value tries to um, uh, guess what the outcome of the game would be. And it's doing it quite well. Um, so it's again the task of regression because we take the input and we try to fit it to uh, one uh, number of classes. And, uh, so for optimization, we again use stochastic gradient, but now we send because we are dealing with uh, mean squared error. And uh, the updates in the weights would be proportional to and this uh, right hand side, and the, um, it, uh, it uh, corresponds to the uh, error between the what neural network would predict and the true value z. So it's just again a machinery in the neural network. Okay. So, 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 so you've uh, you read the uh, network play randomly and uh, <coughs> by this you measure z. Or you see uh, the difference they are from the predicted and the true value z. No, yes, uh, well, uh, the true value it, it's generated from the uh, yeah from the games of the self play. So when you when you have the games of the self play, you you let it play until the end to, to know the winner. So you know the the true value. Yes. And you do it once, or do you many times to some sample the probability. Or? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Do it, do it just once or <coughs> many times? Or? Um, what, what do you mean by doing what? I mean, there was some expected, val expected value at some point. Yeah, so, uh, yeah this is a mathematical, um, like, um, like a precise mathematical value which we would like to approximate with this neural network. Ah, but you don't try to compute the uh, expectation of the average, but you just uh, let uh, yeah, this is just do a one of play out and uh, get one V and put it to the equation. Yes, exactly. This would be uh, the perfect value if, um, so if you get a, a board position, so to, com uh, to compute this you can do it by uh, by sampling the action and computing it all to the end and get the actual value. But the, this neural network tries to um, save the time, the computation, and so to train to predict uh, this value. Uh, function. Did, did it make it clear? Okay. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, I'm gonna hesitate to pause. So that's uh, just uh, what, what's happening there. So all, all these uh, terms they um, look complicated, but um, you just put it in the framework and say uh, you want to optimize this, and then the uh, framework itself like uh, does all the training. So the, the real work of an uh, AI engineer is to design the network and uh, the, the architecture and say what to optimize, but then, that, uh, then the training gets automatically done. So again, uh, overfitting, uh, dangerous here. So if, uh, if we train this value network on uh, positions from one game, it would get overfit because it would memorize uh, the previous positions. That's the problem. So the way how they uh, value network would yeah exactly value network memorize the game outcomes rather than generalizing to new positions. And so the way to get around this is uh, to generate new game positions, and uh, each position is taken from a separate game. So then there was no uh, chance to make this uh, correlation, correlation of memo memorization from one game. So this is a way to, to make it be able to generalize. So uh, the value network can get almost the accuracy of uh, um, basically sampling using the reinforcement learning network, but it uses 15 thousand times less computation and that's the, that's the uh, motivation behind creating this value network not to go always all the way uh, all the time all the way down to the tree and com compute the value but uh, to create a, value, uh, a neural network that will just do it once and uh, try to estimate it and so this is again uh, the dreaming of uh, the value network so it's a uh, evolution of all the possible uh, next moves from, of, of the sport position uh, using the value network. So you can see, um, yeah, you can see it. Uh, so it selected. Uh, yeah. And uh, so in this slide uh, we study the. Uh, Evolution accuracy in various stages of games. So on the x-axis, uh, so the value network gets a board position. That board position can be either very early in the game, 50 moves, or very late in the game. Um, for example, here 285. So obviously, uh, the later the game is, it's easier to predict what the outcome is. And this is the plot. Uh, Good the various neural network behave. So the, the R value network, this full dotted green line, is here. And um, we compare it with different uh, other ways how to uh, select the moves and the probabilistic uh, distribution. And uh, so each position is evaluated by a forward pass of the value network. Uh, uh, Theta, so that's the green one, and um, or it takes uh, 100 kilowatts, that's, that means 100 simulations will be up to the end, and then another simulation to the end of the game. And every time you sample the next move uh, using one of these uh, policies, one of these strategies. So, for example, with the red, uh, with the black one, you just uh, use uniform uh, distribution, so basically random. But then you use uh, you can use the in the blue one you use the, the small neural network the fast one and that that's already of course better than just choosing random uh, the green one the value network the supervised learning policy network uh, the one which try to predict the next move and uh, uh, the the red one is the reinforcement one which we are interested in so we see as mentioned in previous slides it tries to get it's almost as accurate <coughs> as if we would compute it all by simulating all the time. But uh, the, the value network just does it with one 
uh, single pass uh, through the network. That's the <coughs> safe of the time. Okay. <coughs> so, yes, so that was the picture of all the neural networks. Just describe them. And what's next? Okay, so, so, just for comparison, so we can talk about different neural networks. And uh, we uh, try to, in the final, I'm going to use a uh, different combination of them. Uh, we can see, like, uh, the more we use, there's, uh, and then uh, the program is stronger. So this is like, uh, on y axis, there's uh, L rating, um, fine combination. So of course, with full setting, it's, it's the best. But we can see that uh, already, um, the value network itself is uh, stronger than just using the, the network which was doing a uh, new solution. So that was just uh, interesting. Um, can I have a question? Yes. So, uh, these LR ratings, uh, how does it correspond to the dance? <coughs> uh, that's a, a number. Um, there will be one plot when you can see it on the same voice but uh, yeah, something that you can easily find on Wikipedia or something. So you can see it right But uh, 3000 is, I think it's really good, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so now we will talk about the main algorithm, which is the Monte Carlo research, but with uh, the extra aid of these neural networks to speed up all, all the aspects of computation. So, uh, the NCPS, Monte Carlo research algorithm, uh, for like this uh, input, and you get a word position. And now you need to decide what will be the next action, what move to play. So, it will like this that uh, you start to explore the subtree below you at that position. You do uh, some simulations and uh, then you uh, choose the best uh, the best move. The best move that is available. So I will talk about it more in detail now. So there are, uh, there's a selection phase, expansion phase, evolution phase and backup phase which happens only when all the simulations are done. So I will describe them in the next slides. Um, as a implementation <coughs> detail, so each edge <coughs> from the state S and um, uh, with uh, action A uh, keeps uh, some values. One value is the action value Q, which is like um, how how good it would be to play this move. <coughs> so yeah, it's like um, the, the reward. Then uh, how, how many times we visited this edge uh, in the simulation, in the simulations, and uh, some prior probability, which is basically what uh, the supervised learning neural network will give us for, uh, for that action. So basically passing it again for the uh, SL neural network. So uh, the tree is traversed, as I said, by the simulation. Descend the tree from the root state, but the root state is the game position block. And uh, at the end of simulation, summarize up make a move. So, uh, let's start with the selection phase. So, the selection phase is basically uh, going down the tree and uh, selecting uh, which way to go in, the, in that one simulation. And, uh, so, uh, each times at P, which is an action on the edge uh, that uh, maximizes the action value plus some bonus in P. This bonus is uh, proportional to this uh, function. So uh, it's the prior probability, <coughs> like, uh, some, uh, the one given by the SL of the neural network. And, uh, there's, uh, in the denominator, we have this uh, visit count um, um, variable. And this, uh, so basically, 
we want to have high bonus. The high bonus we get for um, actions that would be very probable uh, with human loops. But uh, we want some variety in, uh, in the exploration of the tree. So this, uh, this is the PK, uh, PK part is uh, to make uh, less probable to go every time the same way. <coughs> so other paths. Okay, so that was the selection phase, so choosing which way to go down the tree. Point selection. Then uh, we can reach uh, at one point some leaf node which is not expanded yet. And we may decide um, to uh, expand it to the all positions so into some I guess we got this. So uh, that happens by passing it to the to the neural network, which was uh, the SL1, which was predicting the next human moves, and, um, and that probability. So we get it again probability distribution of the whole board, and it gets stored the, the variables uh, on, on the edges, and these are then used for the bonuses to, uh, to in the selection phase. Uh, so what, when we explored all the way down or up to uh, some uh, leaf node, when we decide, okay, now it's uh, good enough, we don't want to go more into that. So we would like to evaluate uh, this uh, board position, this state. And uh, so there, are, there will be two evaluations happening. So one, the first one is passing it to the neural network which was designed for this value uh, neural network and uh, so we, we get uh, some probability uh, from that and uh, now uh, we, we, we can see like why we needed to use the, the simpler uh, uh, neural network which was the, the faster one but uh, less accurate so that the row up was B5 so uh, this policy is uh, so what happened here is uh, we play in the end game, but all every time sampling from this uh, simple neural network and uh, to get um, also some variety if, uh, in case the value network is not uh, uh, very good. So basically, we have two like, uh, measurements of uh, and then we mix these uh, two evolutions together, basically, through some complex combination using the mixing parameter lambda. And we get a final leaf evaluation, like uh, how uh, valuable is this position. So, for, for example, um, so this is uh, how this position was evaluated by the value network. So, the numbers are action values, PSI, for each possible uh, move. And uh, so, the, the network uh, decided. Other, uh, at, on the second evolution, um, we get the, uh, the position 55 for the, uh, going all the way down with the faster neural network. So this is again an example of the position between alpha group and alpha group. Okay. Um, so the last step happens only when all these emotions happen. So we, we, need, we would like to store the Values and update them. So we update um, the action value, the action value Q, and uh, the visit M, so and they, they will get stored for the next uh, for the future. Okay, so when we have done this, once the search is complete, the algorithm chooses the most visited move from the root position from the position of this, that moment. Okay. So, for example, um, this is the percentage uh, frequency so which actions were selected from the um, So, most of the time, the Monte Carlo research went uh, through, through this uh, action and simulated here really a lot, but they was also thinking about here. 
Very interesting. You see, like, pretty much in the rest of the game, in, in the conservative world. And so this is a principal variation. So it means, like, path with, uh, <coughs> when you always select uh, maximum visit count. So you, the numbers are like, uh, the sequences which are applied. Okay. And so alpha go selected the move indicated by the red circle here. Pan Hui uh, responded with the move indicated by the white square here. But you see that um, alpha go predicted that uh, this move would, uh, would be better because uh, it's, uh, we have a maximum visit count. So in this post, Game commentary. Fun we said that uh, actually you would prefer uh, going here, which was a uh, predictor of the So that was really interesting. So, so, this, this, is, this would be like the ideal uh, point. Okay. So uh, just briefly mentioned. Um, it's very computational having to do all these neural networks and simulations. So the way uh, DeepMind try to uh, make faster is, through, uh, is using uh, asynchronous uh, search. So uh, that means uh, the simulations, the three simulations, uh, the multi are having CPUs, while the passing for the neural networks are uh, offloaded graphic cards and GPUs which are more adept to um, neural networks because they are better at calculating the factor operations uh, which are basically behind the neural networks. Okay, so AlphaGo uses 40 search uh, threads, computer threads, and uh, runs on 40 CPUs and 8 GPUs for the neural networks. There's also a distributed version of AlphaGo and it's running on multiple machines. So again, 40 search threads for multi but over 1200 CPUs and 106 GPUs. So it's a really big one. It's a large machine. But uh, we can see that AlphaGo can be scaled to uh, more machines. So very well designed. So for comparison, these are various uh, combination of AlphaGo with different numbers of threads uh, for Monte Carlo and different num numbers of available GPUs. So for example, in this column, we see it reach a uh, level of 2,200 with one thread and eight GPUs, and that's comparable to using 40 threads uh, uh, but only one GPU. So this would be uh, running on a single machine and running on a distributed among the many machines uh, we, we see that it's uh, only getting better not like significantly but um, this is the way to go if it does first okay so let's talk about uh, the results of how it actually performed so in DeepMind they made this a uh, little tournament with other uh, good Go programs. So on the first dark blue line we see the distributed version of AlphaGo. Light blue line is the regular AlphaGo on a single machine. And uh, so the green line is uh, the human player Fan Hui, the European um, master. And, and the red bars are various uh, Go playing programs. So, Crazy Stone and Zen are a really good uh, commercial Go playing program. And then we have uh, Pachi by Peter Bogish and Fuego, which are um, strong uh, open source Go programs, and GNU Go, which is something very basic. So, as uh, Hans asked, um, this is, uh, you see uh, on these various error ratings and uh, professional uh, uh, the ratings in Q's and Dance. So, Beginners, cues, amateur, dance, and professional. 
So it's uh, yeah, just a correlation like that. So uh, they thought that uh, from from the game they made against uh, other programs that uh, the AlphaGo was somewhere you know, on the third uh, profession of them. And uh, yeah, but we see the results that might be much better. So the first competitor was on me, and he was, uh, he was like a professional second dan in Go, and he, he was a European Go champion in 2013, 2014, and 2015, and so European professional Go champion in 2016, and um, his uh, inner neural network is out of 100 trillion neurons and 100 up to 1,000 trillion neural connections, the estimate. But his neural network is like this for comparison. So, how did the match end it up? So, AlphaGo versus Hanhui. So, Hanhui uh, was completed. Uh, Alpha won, AlphaGo won 5 to 0 in a formal match on October 2015. And so, this is from the match. Uh, we could keep mind. So, what Hanhui said about the game? AlphaGo is very strong and stable. It seems like a wall. I know AlphaGo is a computer, but if no one told me, maybe I would think the player was a little strange, but a very strong player, a real person. That's interesting. Okay. So the next competitor is much a tougher guy. It's a Lee Sedo. So from Stone Stone, and he's a professional ninth then, and uh, he's the second in the international titles, and he was the fifth youngest um, professional goal player in South Korea. And um, just for comparison, uh, Lee Sudo would win 97 of 100 <coughs> games against the previous guy, Fan Kuri. So he's a much tougher. So his biology and neural network is compared with Hanhui. <laughs> <laughs> in number of neurons and connections, I would guess so. It was be very suspicious. <laughs> so um, what Lisa Dahl said before the match. Uh, so um, I heard Google DeepMind's uh, AI is surprisingly strong and getting stronger, but I am confident that I can win at least this time. In an interview with JTBC Newsroom, which is a TV discussion channel, it was mentioned that uh, even beating AlphaGo by 4-1 may allow the Google DeepMind team to claim its de facto victory at the defeat of him, Isidou, or even humankind. So 4-1 from this guy's point of view would, uh, would already be a loss. So surprisingly, um, the game, AlphaGo versus Isidou, was 4-1, but for AlphaGo. And so, in March 2016, AlphaGo won 4-1 against the legendary Lisa Um AlphaGo won all games, but except for the fourth game, and all the games were won by resignation. So it's one way, but uh, And um, so, uh, the winner of the match uh, it was uh, allowed to get one million dollars. So uh, since uh, AlphaGo won, Google DeepMind stated that the prize will be donated to charities, including UNICEF and Go organizations. And Louis Lissado received $170,000, so $150,000 for participating uh, in all the five games, and an additional $20,000 for each game won. So he won the four games, so at least he got some bonus. So that was the outcome of the great game between, between uh, uh, artificial intelligence and one of the top So just to conclude, um, what are, uh, the difficulties of Go is that it's very challenging to make a decision. And uh, the search base is really huge, so searching ex exhaustively is not easy. And, uh, the optimal solution is very complex, so it seems like it's um, not very uh, 
probable that it, we can approximate using the, some uh, policy or value <coughs> function. So, just to summarize, uh, the author book itself uses Monte Carlo research and um, it selects moves uh, effectively and avoids position effectively and it does it through uh, deep convolution neural networks which are trained by the novel combination supervised and reinforcement learning so that was the predicting the next human move and uh, the goal of winning the game of the self way and, uh, and it uses the new search algorithm uh, in Monte Carlo tree search uh, which combines these neural networks uh, evol evolution um, to simple uh, the Monte Carlo uh, laws and simulations and uh, it's also a scale of Implementations. It uh, uses multi-threaded simulation of CPU <coughs> and parallel computes on GPU to, uh, to predictions of neural networks, and uh, it can be uh, either in a distributed version. Uh, it can be in the distributed version over multiple machines. And so this uh, novel approach and novel method. Um, just for comparison, during the match against Fan Bui, AlphaGo evaluated thousands of times fewer positions than. Deep Blue did against uh, Kaspar. And so it's uh, not just brute force, it compensated this uh, thousands of times fewer positions by selecting uh, the positions uh, in a smart way, more intelligent. So that's the policy networks for selection, selecting the next ones. And it evaluated uh, the boards more precisely using the value network. And, um, so Deep Blue relied on Hankrative evolution function, so it was like, um, put inside by smart programmers and designers. Uh, but AlphaGo was trained directly and automatically from the gameplay, and it just used a general purpose learning. So no human uh, made decision <coughs> or function, it was like learning everything <coughs> by itself. So um, the important thing to say about this whole AlphaGo methodology it's not specific to Go. This algorithm can be used for a much wider class of uh, AI problems. And um, there was nothing really Go specific in, in the whole uh, program, except for the rules. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a, like a strong general framework to go into and to, to study AI problems. So thank you. Questions and there will be plenty more questions uh, uh, in the in, in following my manner after the talk. Questions? Actually, was this deep learning used in chess? Uh, if you know. I don't think so because deep learning got really high after 2006. Mm -hmm. Okay, so deep learning is a very old idea from mm -hmm. the 80s, 90s, but couldn't be used at that time because there were two, two big problems, uh, which is uh, not enough data and not enough computing power. So with Deepu, I think what they used was a tree search, but it was... Not really Deepu, just uh, sometimes after, I mean, even ah, recently, okay. just it's used. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have him.